We're beginning um, at verse 32, verse 32 of Luke chapter 23. Uh, Jesus has just been condemned by the Roman governor Pilate, uh, condemned to death. And we pick the story up at verse 32. Two others who were criminals were led away to be put to death with him. And when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him and the criminals, one on his right hand and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save, let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, his chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus... Remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, Truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was now about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour, while the sun's light failed. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And having said this, he breathed his last. Now when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, Certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowd that had assembled for the spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home beating their breasts. And all his acquaintances and the women who had followed him from Galilee stood at a distance watching these things. And then the story continues as Jesus' body is taken down and buried. And we pick it up just for a few verses at chapter 24, verse 1. On the first day of the week, at early dawn, they, that is the women, went to the tomb, taking the spices they had prepared. And they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they went in, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were perplexed about this, behold, two men stood by them in dazzling apparel. And as they were frightened and bowed their faces to the ground, the men said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. Well, welcome everyone. So glad that you can be with us this morning. Uh, the Bible passage that was uh, read for us today gives us part of Luke's account of the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It's just part of the story that uh, makes up what happened all those years ago on the first Easter. And uh, in the passage uh, in particular that, that was uh, read at the beginning, at least, of the passage that was read, we meet uh, Jesus and we meet the two men who were being executed on either side of Jesus, one on his left, the other on his right. So much of Easter uh, 
uh, seems to be concerned with death and uh, in particular uh, the death of Jesus Christ and of course his victory over death in his resurrection. And I don't know whether you have noticed but really in Australia death is just a topic in which we're not allowed to speak about. It has become really something that's, that's quite taboo. Even our funerals we call uh, celebrations of life and so at the very time you, you, you would think that we would speak about death we, we can't even bring ourselves to say the word but all, now all of a sudden we hear about death every day uh, updated in the news every evening uh, numbers of those who have died in Australia numbers of those who have died around the world over 108,000 people have died from the coronavirus. Just in a few months that's happened. 56 people in Australia. In Italy, over 19,000 people have died. America just overtook that number. 20,000 people have died. And it's hard not to take notice when you hear that day by day. It's hard not to be shaken by it. But what is it, do you think, that about death that we find so very scary? I mean, partly for us in Australia, we've suddenly discovered again that we're not as invincible as we thought we were. And that's certainly been something that's shaken us. Uh, partly because we don't like being out of control and certainly death reminds us over and over again that we are not in control of so many things in this world. Uh, but is it also because deep down we know we're not prepared for it? For just about every other event in our lives, if it's an important event and we know it's going to happen, we'll make sure we make preparations for it. Uh, we saw that in uh, the great toilet paper caper of 2020, uh, where we all prepared for our years of isolation by gathering together seven or eight years worth of toilet paper. And those that missed out have become very, very inventive, I'm told. If you have a child being married, you will prepare for that day. And can I say, uh, that's become a lot easier all of a sudden, now that you're only allowed to have five people at, at, the, uh, at the wedding. Every father of the bride has uh, breathed a collective financial sigh of relief. But for just about every event in our life, if we know it's going to happen and we think it's important, we'll, we'll make preparations for it. Why aren't you prepared for the day of your death? Do you think it's not going to happen? One thing the coronavirus has done is reminded us that uh, we too one day will die. And in fact, the coronavirus has just given us another way in which we can die. And uh, every day, we're reminded of that fact as we hear of the new ones who have died overnight from the virus. And every day, I guess, then by default, it asks the question of us, are we prepared for that day? I wonder if it actually surprises you that you could be prepared. I wonder if it would surprise you to know that you should be prepared and how important it is to be prepared for that day. Well, this, come and have a look at this passage with me this morning. And I think in part this passage speaks to that subject. What if you could actually be prepared for your death? This section of uh, Mark that we're going to look at this morning is quite a simple one. Uh, it really only has three characters. There is, of course, the most important character. There is Jesus. And then there are the two criminals who are crucified with Jesus. It seems uh, most likely that, uh, the, 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 that the criminals are, in fact, terrorists. And I want to draw your attention to them uh, this morning 
there was a recent uprising in Jerusalem in which a number of people had been murdered. And it seems most likely that these two criminals uh, were involved in that in some way or another and therefore they are being uh, crucified. Uh, both of them are at the point of execution. Both of them know that they are very soon to meet their maker and as it turns out, neither of them make it to the end of that day before they are dead. And they say that, uh, they say that troubled times uh, often make it clear to us what is important and what is not important. And uh, they say that nothing quite sharpens your focus like facing death. Well, let's see what death, facing death, does to each of these men in turn. Starting with the first terrorist. Let me read to you uh, what he says from Luke chapter 23 in verse 39. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at Jesus. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and save us. Now look, everyone else around the cross was mocking Jesus, hurling insults. Uh, the Jewish authorities took up the chant. They said, he saves others, but he cannot save himself. If you are the Christ, come down from the cross and we'll believe in you. Christ is the name given to God's great king, the Lord of everyone and everything. They're saying, well, if you come down from the cross, then we'll believe that you're the Christ. And this man joins in on the insults, and it's always easy just to join in when you see everyone else making fun of Jesus or everyone else thinking that Jesus really isn't all that important. It's easy just to do what everyone else does, and that's exactly what this man does. He joins in on the insults. Aren't you the Christ? Aren't you God's great king? Save yourself and save us. It's, it's not a genuine request. Uh, he, we're, we're told he's insulting Jesus. And I wonder if you notice that although he is facing death, he is treating Jesus as if Jesus is his servant and he is the master. He thinks that he can tell Jesus what Jesus should and has to do. Now look, if, if Jesus is not all that important, then it, it doesn't really matter how he treats Jesus. And you might give him some leeway, given that he's not got much longer to live. But what if Jesus really is important? What if Jesus really is the Christ? What if Jesus, what if Jesus made us and owns us? What if he is God the Son? It's very different then, isn't it? Who owns you? Uh, who owns what is a big enough question. I live in a house with three daughters, all who are able to wear each other's clothes. And can I say the question of who owns what becomes incredibly important when we're going out. All of a sudden those genes are the genes that I lent you and the genes that I own. I'm very happy, of course, for them to wear my genes at any time, but they never take me up on the offer. Who owns what? is a big question. But who owns you? Well, that's a much bigger question. What if Jesus really is the Christ? What if he is really God's great king? Because if he is, if he is the Christ, then he is the one who made you and he is the one who owns you. The first terrorist would have known all the things that Jesus had been doing in the last few years. All those things weren't done in secret. 
Uh, he did them quite publicly. The blind see, the lame walk, the dead rise. Uh, this man has good reason, I think, at least, at least to be hesitant in regards to the way he treats Jesus. At least to hesitate a moment before he starts insulting him. But I tell you something, if this man has good reason to be hesitant, in fact, good reason to believe that Jesus is the Christ, you actually have better reason. It's not a small thing that three days later, after he was crucified, Jesus rose from the dead. It's Jesus' way of making it as clear as it can possibly be that he really is the Christ. Have a look with me at chapter 24 and partway through um, verse 5. It's, it's no surprise to Jesus what happened. Why do you seek the living among the dead? Jesus is not here, but has risen. Remember how he told you while he was still in Galilee that the Son of Man, which is Jesus' name for himself, must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and on the third day rise. That this Jesus rose from the dead really must make us stop and think. What are we to make of this other than surely we're in the presence of the Lord of life and death? I mean, how else could he have made it any clearer to us than to rise from the dead? How else could he be clearer that he really is the Son of God? I, I doubt this morning that there is anyone listening who hasn't heard the story of Easter and doesn't know that Jesus died on a cross and three days later rose again from death, victor, Uh, how many times have you heard that story? But it's interesting, it's not until you stop and you think about it that you suddenly realise how incredibly impressive it is. Death is the very thing that we've got no control over. Death is the very thing that mocks our life and all that we do in this life and brings it to an abrupt ending. And yet here is Jesus in which every account we have of him tells us of his life and of his death and of his resurrection. He is none other than the, than the Lord of life and death. He is God himself. And, and could he have made it any clearer than he does? He told us this would happen. This man on the cross, he didn't know about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. It hadn't happened yet. But he knew of the other things. And that's why it's staggering that he is so bold as to speak the way he does to Jesus. He, he should at least have hesitated. How do you, how do you treat Jesus? It's, it's got to be the question you ask, hasn't it? How do you treat him? I think most, most Australians perhaps treat him as a house guest, perhaps an unwanted house guest. We say, this is your room, uh, this, this is your bed, you use this bathroom. You can put your stuff here. But you don't expect him to lay claim to the whole house and you certainly don't expect him to lay claim to your life. Can you imagine treating the one who owns everyone and everything as if he doesn't. Jesus, this is your area of my life. This is your area in which you're allowed to, to exist. But don't, don't move outside of that. But you see, Jesus isn't the house guest. He owns the whole place and he owns you and he owns, owns me. And it's a terribly serious thing to ignore him and to act as if he is a no one. And right to the end of his life, that's what this man does. And he is careless in regards to Jesus and careless in regards to being made right with God. 
and he is not prepared for death, though it's staring him in the face. And the, the warning, I think, of this passage is don't, don't be like this man. This man was unprepared. Don't be like him. Well, that's the first uh, criminal or the first terrorist. But there is a second one. And uh, let's turn our attention to, to his response, which is quite different. And we pick it up in verse 40 of chapter 23. But the other criminal rebuked the first criminal. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly, for we are getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now that's got to be a very unexpected request. See, Jesus may have looked powerful when he wasn't on the cross, but you'd have to say he doesn't look like a king on the cross. Three days later when he rose from the dead, he looks like the king, but not on the cross. There was a notice above his head that said he was the king of the Jews, but that, that wasn't that wasn't a serious note. That, that, that was just there to insult him. But in this great flash of understanding, this man suddenly realises who Jesus really is. Now, was, was he thinking clearer than he has ever thought in his life? I mean, they say, as I said, that, that uh, as you look death in the eye, then you can, it has a way of at least focusing your thoughts onto what is important and what isn't. Is that what was happening for him? Maybe. It doesn't always work that way, though, does it? It certainly wasn't the case for the other man. But it seems to me that sometimes, in his kindness to people, that Jesus uses situations just like this so that our minds can see with clarity all of a sudden and we suddenly see what matters and what doesn't matter, and we suddenly see Jesus for who he is. I spoke to one of the, uh, the, the people who work at the Tamworth Base Hospital just last week and asked him how he was going. And he spoke about a nurse that he'd heard of in, uh, in Italy, in one of the hospitals, in the intensive care areas in, in the hospitals in Italy who had the task of, uh, the dreadful task of taking an old man off a ventilator because a young man had come in who also needed the ventilator and had a much higher chance of surviving the coronavirus. And so he was tasks, tasked with removing this ventilator from one man, knowing that he would die and uh, attaching the other man to it. Now, occasions like that surely make us consider things of eternity. Surely when you do something like that, you start to think hard about life and not just about our life and his life, but about what happens next. And am I right with God? And is there life after this life? Has coronavirus made you consider bigger things? In his kindness to you, has Jesus opened your eyes to consider bigger things than the things you have been considering up until now? If he has, wouldn't that be a great mercy to you from him? I think that's what he did to this man. As they hung on the cross in his kindness... Jesus cleared the man's mind so that he could see the truth. Enough to see that Jesus was God's great king. And he humbles himself and he admits his need of help. And he says to Jesus, won't you remember me when you come as king? It's a plea for mercy. It's a plea for forgiveness. 
He says, I know that you are king. I know that you are powerful. I know that I do not deserve forgiveness in any shape or any form. I am getting what I deserve. But is there within you somewhere mercy for someone like me and the promise of a new life? He's not proud. He makes no excuses for his life. He comes to Jesus empty-handed and he says, will you remember me when you come as king? And Jesus says to this second man, I tell you the truth, today you will be with me in paradise. Now there are some, pri- there are some surprising things that have been said in this world. But that has got to be the most surprising and perhaps the most wonderful. This man put all his trust in Jesus, the king, and asked him for mercy. And Jesus treated him with mercy, though he deserved none of it. All his life, this man had mucked it up. And moments before it was too late, he asked Jesus for mercy and he received it. See, what's going to happen to you on the other side? What's going to happen to you after your death? Sometimes people say, no one has really come back to tell us what happens on the other side. But that's just not true, is it? Because Jesus has come back, the great conqueror of death, risen from the grave. He says, I am God, the Son, follow me. You can walk through death with me. I am the way, I am the truth. I am the life. No one comes to the Father apart from me, says Jesus. How does it work? How can you be prepared like this man was? And the interesting thing is it, it's not that complex. He recognised Jesus as his king. And though he didn't have many moments left, he followed him as his king. Throw yourself upon him for mercy and for forgiveness. And the wonderful thing is, when the staggering thing is, Jesus is a king who loves to show mercy to people who come to him like that, even if you've been a terrorist. And on the great day in which you stand before him in judgment, you'll stand before him forgiven because of Jesus Christ. Today, you will be with me in paradise. You will be safe with Jesus. I don't know if you're a member of any exclusive clubs. I'm not a member of any myself. I'm too nervous to go near them, to tell you the truth. Uh, My family and I were meant to be on holidays next week at Southwest Rocks. And, uh, of course, that won't be happening, sadly, now. But there is a place at Southwest Rocks called the Country Club. Uh, I myself have always been too nervous to go there. It's a very big, impressive looking building on the top of a hill. And I'm absolutely sure there must be a bouncer there. And if I turn up, I'm sure he'll say, are you a member here? And I'll have to say, no, I'm not. That's nothing, of course, compared to being a member of the Australian Club which was founded in 1838 and has as members and past members uh, John Howard and Banjo Patterson and Kerry Packer. Now that's an exclusive club to be a part of and I can tell you now they won't let you in. They won't let me in so they certainly won't let you in either. Can you imagine walking up to the door of the Australian club stopped by the bouncer I imagine they have there And when he says to you, do you have membership here? There's not much else you can say other than, no, I don't. But at that moment, can you imagine how things would change if the founder of the club walked out and said, I know this person. He's with me. Let him in. It would mean that you got let in to the place in which you do not deserve to be. 
on the great day of judgment, when you've come through death and you're asked the question, will you be with Jesus in paradise? Do you have membership here? On that day, some will hear the most terrifying words there are to hear, I think. Jesus will come out and say, I never knew you. Depart from this place. But this second criminal and all those who belong to Jesus in this world will hear the words, it's all right. I know this one. He's with me. Let him in. She's with me. Let her in. That's the promise he's making to this man. You'll be with me in paradise. How about you? There are only two men because there are only two outcomes. Which one will be you? Can I urge you this morning to consider Christ? Maybe in his kindness to you, he's made you consider life and death. And are you right with God for the first time in your life? What a, what a mercy to you from Jesus. Well, don't stop there. Won't you consider him? Won't you come to him as your king? Come to him empty-handed. Plea for mercy and forgiveness. And he says you'll find in him a king who loves to forgive, even if you're a terrorist. Well, let's, let's come together and pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the Lord Jesus Christ and for the way in which he shows to us that he is the, the Son of God. We thank you for his death and for his resurrection, which really so clearly shows him to be who he says he is. Lord, give us eyes to see Jesus. Give us ears to hear what he has to say. Give us hearts that come to him as our king, seeking from him forgiveness and mercy and finding him to be a king who loves to give such things to his people. Keep us from being arrogant and full of pride and ignoring him to the end. Lord, we thank you for Easter and all that it is and all that it says about Jesus. Lord, we pray in your mercy, bring us to Christ that we might find ourselves with him forever. We pray in his name. Amen.